Coming up on this week in computer hardware, MacBook Pro, don't buy one yet. Quiet PC has the most gorgeous nook ever. NVIDIA dumps Vista adds Overwatch, NVMe versus SATA, M.2 versus U2, and OCZ Revo Drive gets a thumbs up. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 365, recorded May 26, 2016. New MacBook Pro? Wait for it, people. This episode of Twitch is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. For a free seven-day trial and 30% off the life of your account, go to ITProTV slash Twitch and use the code TWITCH30. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most delightful, most engaging, and today most oral surgery-filled hardware news available on the Internet's, well, we'll say on the planet Earth today. We're going to think small. Ryan is not here. He is actually in China, getting his Computex on, his pre-Computex. We'll talk about that for a second. But joining us, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Storage himself, Alan Malventano. Hey, man. Hi. Nice to be here. <laughs> you, you got a good, you know, 12 hours notice on this one. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, from a man who was on a plane over the Pacific at the time, which I thought was so Jetson, so space age. Yeah, he, uh, he told us he, told us he got flight. no sleep on that 12-hour flight. Was he traveling cattle or business? Uh, yeah, yeah, he was. He was in with the the sheeple or whatever. Well, he just needs to spend more time taking care of the baby at three in the morning. That whole sleep thing will take care of itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my goodness! Not a lot of news from Computex yet. Uh, MSI gave Ryan a sneak peek before the show, which basically means they sent out giant piles of press kits and illustrations. Um, GS sixty three Stealth Pro with Core i seven six seven hundred HQ and GTX nine seventy M inside. Uh, a five heat pipe system called the Cooler Boost Trinity. I wish we had <laughs> pictures of the Cooler Boost Trinity. Uh, you know, RGB keyboard in there, uh, whirlwind blades pushing hot air out of the exhaust ports. Uh, more information on that going to be coming at the show. The uh, GTA. Did you, see the, and did you see the backpack thing? Yes. <laughs> I'm not even sure where to go with that. Well, you know, I just skip down to the backpack PC. Strap yeah. a Core i7 and a GTX 980 to your back so that you are not tied to a desk when using VR. With that amount yeah, so, of power, you'll still... <laughs> so I saw the picture and I was like... Board. I saw the picture and I was like, oh, okay. So it makes it easier to like bring your PC to a LAN party or something. And then I read the words. And wait, no, they mean for you to wear that while it's operating. <laughs> and, and while using VR, right? But like, so VR with the VR workload being processed by the thing hanging off your back. Um, well, fortunately, some of the, uh, some of the, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how loud that <laughs> thing is. I just, like, what if you like, you know, you're in VR, like there's potential hazards, like you might trip, you know. Well, you might trip even without carrying 20 pounds of PC on your back. Maybe it's not that yeah. And I mean, their idea is that you don't have to have all the cords for the VR stuff, but you, now you have to replace that with the power cord. So now it's, it's like a much more dangerous cord to have like, you know, mains power hooked up to the thing hanging on your back. You've never walked they, around with an extension cord dangling off your belt? Like sure. feet of 12. Yeah, see, now it's coming out. If it was sure, so dangerous, sure. why'd you do it? <laughs> I, I just accept that danger. I just don't do that while using VR and basically being blind to the outside world, like I the real a, outside world. A big place, Matt, when you open up the top of the box for the backpack PC, you open it up, and the first thing you see is VR can be a dangerous, you know what I mean? Like, you, you totally oh, yeah, be yeah. like, you know, do not use VR backpack without supervision. Do not feed VR backpack after midnight. Do not... You know, beware of tripping <laughs> over your own power cable and electrocuting yourself. Do not walk on floor of cable cutting knives while dragging extension cord powerful enough to drive, you know, Core i7 and GTX 980. Yeah. I don't know. It, I, I'm kind of disappointed that it's not battery powered, but, you know, having carried enough battery uh, to, to keep something like that running for an hour, 
I know exactly why it's not battery powered. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Oh, I do like goodness. that other idea though. Like, like you know, we're gonna do QuakeCon soon, and like you always see right. this huge line of people trying to get into the BYOC, and they're all got like their computers on carts, yeah. right? Imagine this thing. You could just have a dude just chilling with like a backpack on and like, you know, an it's LCD on his arm. Back. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. And that, that'd be it, right? He'd just have all I'm of his sure stuff. You, maybe it's going to, uh, you know, it's be a good reuse for an Alice pack frame. Yeah. With a vase amount. An Alice pack frame, a vase amount, and you'd be able to like strap it to your desk so it wouldn't like fall off. Yep. I think you've got something there. The ultimate. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate wilderness pack pack gaming PC. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and then there was a, the, the last, before we move on, there was a desktop, like one picture down that actually looked like a pretty cool desktop case. I just wanted to mention it. They only give us this tiny picture, but, um, tiny it, pictures. you know, it kind of has a face to it. Like mm -hmm. sort of Optimus Primish, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of look, look pretty cool. Is that uh, Aegis gaming? Yeah. It looks kind of like a Sonic the Hedgehog profile, but it's a, PC case, yeah. Alan, I'm oh. going to have to eat your face. Uh, they also have uh, <laughs> some X99 motherboards, including, ladies and gentlemen, an RGB model, so that your keyboard, your mouse, your case lighting, and your motherboard lighting, hopefully, can all match. Yeah. Yeah, Man. I wonder if someone's going to make, like, a unified interface for this that just, like, talks to all the things. Because right now, you have to install a piece of software from, like, every, you know, Logitech's got theirs, Corsair's got theirs. Potentially, you could have a Logitech mouse course, our keyboard, this, you know, it's like three separate things you're having to install just to do your lighting. Um, <laughs> I just think it needs to be, you know, it just needs to be unified. They need to be like, you know, make an API for each one of those things or something and just like, you know. Next thing you're going to tell me that home automation gear. Oh, it's the same mess. It's a totally together. the same mess. Yeah. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is our home automation minute. <laughs> It's a hot mess, but it's kind of getting better, sort of. Choose a hub that has everything and hasn't been recently purchased by, oh, I don't know, Google. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to see how Google Home holds up because uh, Google just dropped their, their Nexus media player, not surprisingly. Uh, I don't think it ever remotely turned in a percentage of the numbers uh, that the Chromecast did. Um, but, uh, and, you know, the other thing that was interesting is... Uh, uh, the Nexus 9 tablet is no longer being produced. So if you've been thinking about buying the big Nexus, um, you know, unless you see it on sale uh, or a dropped price, you might not want to buy one. Because uh, yeah. uh, HTC has said they've stopped manufacturing Google's flagship tablets. Um, there has been no announcement for a replacement on that. Uh, you know, the Pixel C is there, but the Pixel C is expensive. Um, you know, it also, one of the things that uh, the CNET article we found out about this from pointed out uh, was that the, uh, you know, Nexus 9 was never as popular as the Nexus 7. Yeah. So, something to think about if you're in the world of tablet shopping land. Just say it. Just say it. Mm -hmm. You, sir, have been... You, Another chance for redemption of the OCC brand. Toshiba's OCC RD400 512 gigabyte PCIe NVMe SSD, also known as the M.2 Revo drive. And I'm going to pepper you with a couple extra questions after this, talking about NVMe versus SATA M.2 U.2, because I've been getting it. It's funny, a friend of mine's specking up a system, and he really wanted to use the M.2 slot on the motherboard, but getting it. Let me pause. Why don't you tell us about the M.2 repo drive? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's basically like a kind of a reboot of the repo drive, right? Uh, there were a few repo drive launches back in like the early part of the decade. You know, it's been years back since the original ones came out. Um, and then they respun another one a couple of years ago, right after the acquisition by Toshiba. Right? They made a, a repo drive 350, which is basically just the same formula, Sandforce controllers and a RAID. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, using Toshiba Flash, naturally, because they got acquired by Toshiba, so why not use, you know, Flash from, from the company that's, uh, that's running things, right? Um, mm -hmm. So this is a new spin on it. It's M.2. Uh, you can get it with an add-in card, uh, just as a different product, 
uh, part if you want for an additional 20 bucks or over the cost of the bare M.2 drive. If you have a motherboard that just has M.2 slots and you don't have to worry about that adapter. Um, right. It looks in many ways to be a rebrand or a consumer facing brand uh, like rebrand of the Toshiba XG3 which is an OEM part that came from Toshiba that was just in, you know, some Dell, Lenovo, et cetera, laptops. Um, and that tends to happen a lot with M.2. Uh, you'll see a company decides to just make them, like even Samsung did it with like the SM951. Um, the only way we were able to review that was because it just happened to be in a laptop that we got in for review. Um, same kind of deal with the XG3. We actually didn't see that in any systems come through, but I, uh, I think on page two of the article, uh, I compared an add-on run to what uh, an add-on run from uh, the SSD review uh, when they, they reviewed an XG3, and the add-on runs looked identical to each other. Um, so it pretty much looks like, you know, it's the same controller, it's the same kind of flash, all the, you know, all the same stuff. It just has a Revo drive label on it, and Revo, and OCZ has now kind of morphed into Toshiba's uh, retail slash consumer brand, because this drive is not called a Revo drive, it's called a Toshiba uh, RD... 400 or Toshiba OCZ RD 400, right? So it's like OCZ has now kind of changed or transitioned into uh, a sub brand of Toshiba, right? Um, so that's the case with all that stuff. The specs uh, look strikingly similar to a 950 Pro. The pricing is also similar to the 950 Pro in the 256 and the 512 gig capacities. However, uh, this drive is also available in 128 and one terabyte. Uh, and one terabyte, OCZ has actually beaten Samsung to the punch on because there is no 950 Pro one terabyte, um, which potentially makes this the best performing one terabyte and only one terabyte M.2 SSD that you can buy right now, um, which is also interesting, right? Uh, we right. reviewed the half a terabyte model, which should perform similarly to the one terabyte model. Um, if you go to the random performance uh, tab of that review, I think that's on page four, uh, we saw some kind of weird things going on when we did our typical iometer uh, testing. And if you notice, the white line in that chart there is not kind of following the same kind of trend that the other ones do, specifically once it gets just right that one notch before the end there, it just kind of dips. Um, mm -hmm. And then the same goes for the third and fourth chart on that page. There's just kind of random dips. Actually, the fourth chart... There's a couple of dips throughout that run, uh, one near the beginning, one near the end. And that's the, the exact kind of thing. It's the reason that uh, we've developed the new testing that we've, been, that we've been using, the latency percentile testing, which is actually on uh, the next page. Um, and if you go to the next page, which is the, uh, the weighted latency percentile page, I will tell you which picture to look at. It is the... Uh, oh, wow. You're going to have to go to the first one under <laughs> rights which is about like halfway down the page. Um, that shows the results of the RD400. It's the one with the weird kind of shelf thing going on. Yep, that's the one. Um, and th we're doing this a new way now. We used to weigh them based on IOs. And the catch was if you had an SSD that was intermittently slow, which as you can see, there's a disk transfer rate plot going there just from Task Manager. And you can see it's kind of jumping around and every 10 seconds it takes a dip. Um, and what that is actually happening is a few of those IOs out of the, you know, like 100,000 uh, per second that it's able to do, um, a few of them go really slow and take really long. Uh, and we are now weighting that chart up there based on time out of the run, not based on the number of IOs that did that speed. So in other words, that shelf that you see at like that 63% mark, uh, it wouldn't be visible. It would basically be all the way at the top and the drive would look like it was just amazing. But in reality, it wasn't. There was kind of a catch there. So what you're looking at there is most of the IOs are acting very quick. The latency is all the way to the left there on that chart. But as you get towards the top, it just hits a little plateau and it shifts all the way out into between like 10 and 100 millisecond range, which is actually hard drive territory. Okay, so if you're hitting this drive with a lot of random writes, which isn't very common for consumer, but it is possible. Um, it acts like a hard drive about, uh, you know, like 36% of the time um, out, of the, out of the total time that you're trying to write to it. It does fluctuate, but right. that, that is our way of representing like 
you can see the fluctuation just summed up in one plot. You don't have to like look at, okay, how often was it slow? How often was it fast? It just all shows it to you there. Um, Is that something so, that they might be able to fix with a firmware upgrade? Uh, it could very well be. Um, I, I will say that this is much better than what we were seeing with the previous two OCZ SSD releases, their previous two SATA releases, um, which were stalling for like a couple of seconds at a time in some cases. Um, remember those? Like we were kind of like, yeah, you might not want to buy these. So this one, I, I would still recommend because the read performance is through the roof. Um, in, some, in some cases, actually beats the 950 Pro. Um, and it's available in a higher capacity. So if you absolutely need one terabyte, um, you know, you can now get it in M.2. Uh, you just have to be careful on hitting it with a bunch of random writes. You know, it might not be very happy about it, but, you know, it still does perform for most of the other things you're going to be doing with it. And as long as you don't load it down too much on the writes, it actually still does pretty well. Um, so just something to be aware of. Um, the typical person that throws an M.2 SSD in a gaming system and they want to have like every Steam game that they've purchased downloaded to it, hopefully less than a terabyte worth, um, you know, this would still work well for them because they're not hitting their drive with a lot of writes. You know, they're just playing games, they're doing reads, and this does just fine for that. So, okay. That's part of why I got uh, the gold award. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's still worthy of an award. It's just that, um, you know, I can't totally bash a drive based on testing that's this detailed because I, I hate to say it, there's a good chance that Shiba themselves don't, hasn't even seen those numbers from this drive because I don't know of anybody else that's able to test this way yet. Um, but that's just what comes with, you know, when you make your own testing. So <laughs> I got to give them a chance to, to see it and then, you know, respond. So uh, other than that, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, a pretty decent drive. So I'm happy to see OCZ on kind of a trend, you know, getting away from drives that just take a nap for a couple of seconds at a time. This one didn't do that. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always awkward when you're trying to load a game and you just spend two minutes staring at your screen wondering why your hard drive just won't do anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, those previous ones, it was, it was actually also related with trim. So if you had a drive that was full and you decided to blow it away and do like a Windows reinstall, it would take potentially up to a couple of minutes just to do the quick format because trim would take it like a couple of minutes, um, which is not a quick format. So, you know, there's just weird stuff like that going on. But that does not apply to this one. This one was good. This is good. So let's talk about um, NVM Express, NVMe, the non-volatile memory express, which is an alternative to SATA, uh, yep. which can be found on what effectively look like two and a half inch drives. Uh, M.2 drives or U.2 drives, M.2 versus U.2, which are two things that look like memory but are actually hard drive formats uh, for inserting cards in your machine. When, when's it time at this point? Is, you know, NVMe promises a significant, a ridiculously huge uh, performance boost uh, over SATA. Um, when does somebody need NVMe? I mean, it, it's, it's ground up built for SSDs. The performance is phenomenal, like potentially double SATA throughput. When sure. is it time to, 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 to basically pay the extra cash to go with NVMe instead of SATA for your well, part SSD? Of the, part of the advantage to it is just more of where NVMe lends itself, which is because it's a smaller device. Usually they're an M.2 form factor most of the time. Uh, and now they tend to be in all of the mobile devices that have SSDs in them just because it's you know easier to fit in than, the, than a hard drive. Uh, sure. NVMe helps compared to the older thing, which was AHCI, more in power consumption, not power consumption from the SSD, trying to do the work, but right. from the operating system and the kernel, which has to do a lot less work for every IO that it does to that storage. That's what NVMe kind of adds. You know, it's, I, I, sometimes I refer to it as like the, the DirectX 12 of like storage, right? The X12 <laughs> is supposed to reduce a lot of that overhead right. from, from that, you know, that protocol and everything. Well, this is the same thing just for, for storage, for SSDs, right? Um, same kind of thing. I, I, I think there's even like RAID card makers that are switching over to using NVMe as the protocol between the computer and the RAID controller. Right. And it had nothing to do with solid state drives, just that it's a less overhead protocol, right? Um, compared to the older AHCI thing. AHCI was made when the fastest thing out there was like a Velociraptor hard drive. Um, and, which was you know, fast, but wh which really was fast. That's completely kicked yeah. by SATA, or but excuse it, me, by yeah. SSDs. Yeah, but in, but in terms of like, um, you know, how fast your storage was compared to how fast your, your, your computer was, it was just, you know, eons of time. It would be waiting for the next IO to come in relative to what all the things the CPU could do in the meantime, right? I mean, you had mm -hmm. milliseconds worth. 
Um, and once you speed up the storage so fast, you get to the point where the CPU becomes a bottleneck. It's like when you upgrade your GPU so so many times and, and that game, you know, it becomes CPU bound as opposed to GPU bound, right? Um, same kind of deal. So you get power savings on the laptops. You get potentially more IOPS capability on your PC. Um, but it, actually, even in that review, uh, the last picture on that first latency percentile page is actually an 850 Evo. Um, and latency-wise, it did pretty good. It's just that it can't hit as fast of a latency as an NVMe device because every I.O. has to wait X amount of time to like make it through the CPU before it even gets to the device. And then once that, you know, once that I.O. comes back, it has to go through some other steps within the kernel before it can get back. NVMe reduces all that stuff, right? So it ends up making things just that much snappier assuming you had like the same exact capability of a controller on a SATA device or an NVMe device, right? Um, and I think the thing you're kind of drilling a little bit more towards in your question is like, do you absolutely need NVMe if you have SATA and you're happy with it? I would say probably not. Like you don't, you don't have to do it. If you really, especially if you're using like a SATA RAID, um, like two, three, maybe even four drives in like a RAID zero, if you're going, if you're going absolutely crazy on like your SATA stuff, uh, chances are that's going to do just about as good as a single NVMe drive would do. You know, you might get a little bit lower latency even compared to a, a RAID of, of SATA devices, but still it's going to be pretty snappy. It's going to be able to go almost the same throughput uh, in some cases, maybe even higher uh, than a single M.2 drive. So, you know, it's, it's really just like, it's kind of like a power user thing, right? <laughs> um, right. Except they just, except they tempt you because it's in a really, really tiny package and it could just kind of blend in with your motherboard and you don't even have to worry about wiring up SATA. Um, right. You know, so it, it, in those ways, it's even more of a convenience, right? As opposed to, uh, you know, just going for like the ultimate speed. And you do pay about twice the cost per gig for M.2 devices compared to SATA devices. Um, you know, so you kind of, pay, you're paying for the extra performance, you're paying for the convenience, um, you know, but you can still get good speed out of SATA. Mm-hmm. There you have yep. it, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. Oh, Did that's that answer it. your question, sir? <laughs> yeah, perfectly. <laughs> Most people don't need it. If you want to spend the money, you know, if you're a superpower user, like you're crazy video slash I'm, you know, rendering all the code and I need all the space and it almost starts to make sense, but it is yeah. prohibitively expensive. Yeah. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're doing a system build right now and you're, and you're worried about the capacity also, you know, because not all motherboards support multiple M.2 devices. Um, you know, with SATA, it's still easier to do, right? You can just have a single, like a 850 Evo 500 gig or something for a system build. And then, oh, I want my C drive to be bigger. All right, buy a second 850 Evo, put them in RAID. You know, <laughs> with Intel RST, you can do that and not even have to do a reinstall. You can just add the second drive and just expand it. Um, you know, and, and then the throughput will be double and the IOPS will be roughly double and you will have doubled your capacity um, very simply, you know. So it's not that easy with M.2 yet. There you have it. Oh, my goodness. Um, if you're thinking about buying a MacBook Pro, stop. <laughs> I want to wait until Q4 this year. Uh, 9 to 5 Mac is a great article quoting, uh, well, I'll just quote 9 to 5 Mac. Reliable Apple analyst Ming-Chi Ko at KGI Securities, corroborated by 9 to 5 Mac sources, say that Apple plans to introduce a dramatically overhauled MacBook Pro later this year. Uh, Quo says that the device will have a new thinner and lighter design with design cues taken from the 12-inch MacBook as well as Touch ID support and a new OLED display touch bar above the keyboard. The brightest OLED spot. OLED display touch bar? For Apple's huh. 2016 rollout. So there's going to be some interesting changes on uh, keyboards and, and what we kind of think of, you know, function keys or, or uh, uh, F keys. But the touch bar is going to basically uh, be all of the function keys that you would find on a Apple laptop uh, on we've, a MacBook. We've seen, we've seen Lenovo dabble with that, but not with OLED, right? Yeah. They've dabbled with that with like a LCD yeah. um, above there. I'm, I'm surprised to not hear like more rumors of just the OLED for the whole display from Apple well, at this point. Because we've seen at, at CES, we saw a couple of Lenovo machines that had OLED displays in them that are supposed to be coming out this year. Um, you know, they looked amazing too. Like those screens looked really good. Um, yeah, you, you, you and I and Robert Heron need to have a talk about OLED color accuracy 
which is still <laughs> well, a curious concept. A, a company, for, a company like Apple doing that would presumably pre-calibrate them going out the door. If I they would could imagine calibrate it, if they oh really, back yes. is that a thing? It's yeah, a, it's a, is it like the, well, the wrong wavelength? Well, it seems to be with the flagship of television. It's, uh, you know, it's it's hard to separate the glass from the manufacturer. But let's just say, one, the other thing is, A, expense, B, volume, because Apple's going to produce a lot of these, and C, whether or not there are any color issues that can or cannot be overcome. Um, yeah. I was also laughing because, you know, somebody was like, wait, metal injection molding for the hinge. They make pistol frames out of it. Relax. It just means squirting metal into a mold. You know, it's an alternative to lost wax casting. Calm down, people. Um, Actually, that's a that's that's along the lines of the whole liquid metal thing that kind of sort of didn't take off. Like the thing that made all it ended up being was a bunch of the sim removal tools, the liquid metal things. Remember? Uh, that's that's like injection molded metal casting. That's yeah. basically what that is. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, HP is continuing to march on with its attempt to be the baddest the new badass hp i think is all the only thing i can say um they have revived the omen brand from voodoo pc which was bought by hp back in the day uh when everybody was buying a cool uh boutique gaming pc manufacturer um but uh so the omen name is back a uh, new lineup of laptops and desktops rights and gadgets as well as a 32 inch quad hd monitor that means essentially 4k um Pretty aggressive pricing too. Eight ninety nine for the fifteen point six inch laptop gets up to about a thousand for a seventeen point three inch model. Um, you know, and like Dell and everybody else, they're aiming to be VR ready on the desktops to be able to run the HTC Vive and Oculus Rift. Um, it looks good. You know, it's kind of like oh yeah, you know, it's a yeah, it's got that logo and it's got an orange keyboard and it's it's in that sort of footprint of black laptops with keyboards that glow in colors. Uh, to attract gamer, gamers, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what yeah, else to yeah. say about it. It is a, it uh, is a, and I'm a nice. I like that it's a full keyboard too. This is a good thing. Are it's you except? Bad. Although the full keyboards always seem to be offset to the screen to me, which drives me insane. But that's a, that's yeah. a conversation for another day. It's true. Are you? I know Ryan's been wearing his Pebble watch again. Are you currently wearing any sort of digital timepiece? I have been resisting. My wife is all big on the Apple Watch because she does a lot of running and stuff like that. And she went through just about every other GPS tracking thing that you put on your arm right. uh, and eventually ended up settling on an Apple Watch. And just because she, you know, I, I think that's the only thing for her that she would run like a half marathon and it would actually say that she ran that length of a distance on the thing, right? Um, right. Everything else was just like grossly inaccurate for some reason. So uh, I'm resisting. I'm, I'm holding out on like, you know, uh, V2 Apple Watch if I do anything at all. But yeah. you know, it'd be interesting to see how long that takes. Um, I bring that yeah. up because Pebble is back. Uh, they're back on Kickstarter. Why fund it yourself when you can get your customers to fund it? But uh, the first oh. update, the original Pebble, the Pebble 2, and uh, quote, says Ventures beat the first big change to its pricier time smartwatch. And then also, uh, if you keep scrolling. Yeah. We'll see a little box called the core. What is, what is that thing? Well, it's funny. You should. It's something your your wife your wife might love because it'll play a Spotify playlist, uh, and it does GPS tracking, and it's huh. small enough to be a keychain, and it's going to sell for seventy bucks, which means I'm actually tempted to buy one. Not that I would yeah. probably use it, but uh, the price I think is right on that one. So that launched like I don't know forty eight hours ago. And they have uh, they have hit seven point nine million dollars of their one million dollar goal, and they have thirty four days to go. So I'd say Pebble's doing good. It's a good week yeah. to be at Pebble. I'm, um, I'm just still still kind of raising an eyebrow to the whole like you're a company already. Like what are you doing on Kickstarter? I, I don't know. It just seemed weird to me. You know, thought, I'm I'm down with it, but you know, I, I guess um, <laughs> I just thought Kickstarter was for like. The, you know, the new guy trying to kickstart his thing, but these guys a are lot like of clearly. Established comp well, if, you know, if you, if you can, look, if, if you can take, you know, if, if you do it this way, right, you, you're paying yeah. a credit card charge fee, but you're not paying interest on a loan. You have the money, you have the ability, you, you know exactly how many you have to shift. Yeah, um, yeah. 
I can you see. Know, it. I think there's a lot of. I think it's. I think it's smart, and it worked for them the first time. So why on earth wouldn't they go back and do it a second time? <laughs> uh, it's, it's true. If it ain't broke, I guess. Don't yeah. fix it. So you added an article. Uh, it's got posted minutes, minutes before we started recording. Yes, Boomer just mere minutes. On Nvidia's high-end Pascal GPUs. What's the story? Uh, yeah, and actually I posted it, and I haven't even got to read all the way through it because he <laughs> it's, it was literally hot off the press. He's like, hey, you guys should talk about this on Twitch. I just put it up. and and uh, But it's basically like kind of collecting all of the information and rumors on GP102, which would be like what goes into 1080 Ti. Right. Right. Um, when, if and when there is one. Um, and, uh, because there is a lot of stuff flying around on it. So I think it just, you just really needed to like sit down and collect it all into like one place that talks about Pascal and he gets, he's into a lot of like GP, GPU type of stuff, like rendering and all that other stuff, uh, like really in the weeds level. So he goes pretty in depth into like, okay, how does, how does all the floating point math work with these different architectures and, you know. How many different shaders? How many of everything? So he's really going like in the in the weeds on it. Um, I will definitely be reading all the way through it once I'm done here. I recommend uh, it's anybody nice. interested in GPU tech probably at least take a glance at it because um, it looks like a pretty good collection of info and rumors so far. A lot of rumors. Well, you know the idea of a new chipset, something that nestles in between the GP100 and the GP104. Uh, yep. You know, I I think this is going to be interesting. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I think so and, too. it's it's also not doesn't mean you should not buy a 1080 if you can get your grubby little paws on it as soon as possible. But it's also 1080, 1080 is a pretty good like, performer. Yeah, yeah, 1080 yeah. is a ridiculous performer. Um, the uh, yeah, that whole the discussion actually the discussion of the one to two to four ratio between 64 bit, 32 bit, 16 bit calculations um, is really really interesting. But uh, yep, yeah, as far as the 1080 stuff out, goes. I think the launch is tomorrow, right? Yeah. 1080, the actual, like, when you can place orders and stuff. There are a few people that I know that are, like, have all of their, like, alarm clocks set and, like, <laughs> you know, notification email things set and, like, every possible other thing set and they just want to order it. So, yeah, I'm pretty totally sure the demand, yeah. the, the, the demand is confirmed for, for 1080. <laughs> um, I, I can tell. What's really funny is right now there are people pre-selling like Founders Edition cards for $865 on Amazon. <sighs> it's just so wrong. Yeah. So wrong. I can't even wait. I, like wait about three days and then like look on eBay <laughs> and, and see the gougers yeah. getting uh, like scalpers. Whatever you do, don't, don't buy a 980 Ti this week. <laughs> no. <laughs> Unless it's really, really on sale, because it's, it's not like it's a bad card. Oh, and the stupid Alexa thing thinks that I said her name. Nope. Okay. Uh, all right, what's next? We should take a moment to thank our sponsor, ladies and gentlemen. IT Pro TV. You may be asking yourself, how do I break into the world of IT? IT Pro TV can help. They've been, they were inspired by Twit. They realized that video is a great way for a lot of people to learn, and they put together an incredible and ever-growing collection of videos to learn how to do things. Um, look, you probably want to get a better a job, a new IT job, an IT job that, you know, represents growth in your career or at least not going backwards. Uh, and, hey, you know what? Even if you already have your dream job and you're stupid happy with where you're at, you know, a good IT pro is constantly learning. IT Pro TV is the best way to stay up to date with current technology certifications because it's crazy. They got a thousand hours of content. They're adding new courses weekly. You can stream the courses live and on demand worldwide. Your Chromecast, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, or PC. You can learn on the go with your mobile device. If you it has a screen and an internet connection, you can probably get IT Pro TV on it. They've got course topics like Microsoft Server 2016 MCSE, CCNA routing and switching, SSH, Azure, SQL, home router configuration. Hear that? You can finally figure out how to make your home router behave and quite a few more. The recently completed CISA, a globally recognized certification in the field of audit control and security of information system with Cybex author Brian O'Hara. Uh, Adam Gordon is returning in June for CEH V9. June courses will also include CCNA security from Cisco and VCP6 VMware. 
Um, it's time to learn about security if you're if you're behind on that. Transcript selects you follow from start to finish or jump right to any part of the video. You get 100-plus step-by-step virtual machine labs and the Transcender practice exams that help you get prepared for the examination. That's a $109 value right there. One low monthly subscription price, no hassle cancellation policy. Corporate and group pricing is available if there's a whole bunch of you. Clients include Harvard, MIT, UCSD, Stanford, and many many more. It's good stuff, people. Check out itpro.tv slash twitch. That's itpro.tv slash twich to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications. Premium subscriptions are normally $57 a month or $570 a year. We have a special offer for you because you listen to the show. Try IT Pro TV for free for seven days when you sign up using our code TWITCH30. That's T-W-I-C-H 30 to check out their courses, live stream, and more. You'll receive 30% off for the lifetime of your account. That's less than 40 bucks a month or 399 for the entire year, ladies and gentlemen. That is cheap if you want to get your certifications quickly and efficiently or just keep building your knowledge base. ITPro.tv slash TWICH and use the code TWITCH30 to try it free for seven days and save 30%. We want to thank ITPro.tv for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what to say other than it's nice. Uh, since we seem to have been spending most of our lives for the last five or six years turning around and needing a new socket every three years, I exaggerate slightly. <laughs> but uh, AMD Zen processors uh, look to be, or the socket AM4, uh, wrote Sebastian, uh, it's compatible with existing AM2 and AM3 coolers. So yep. that's one less thing you're going to have to buy when you're moving to your new machines. And more importantly, it means people that manufacture uh Fans won't have to build something new. Coolers won't have to build something new for the ground up to work. That was with that was the bigger deal, right? Because yeah, like what AMD's I mean. AMD's fighting for market share on their CPU side, especially, and uh, you don't want to give manufacturers a chance to have to second guess whether or not they should yeah. retool for some uh, new. I don't cooler. know if I want to make this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, you know, give them one less reason to uh, to, to ditch support, which All is good. Do and is just keep making the ones they're already making. <laughs> Well, not only that, but you've got people, you know, AMD is their water cooling, they got water blocks, and it's like it's almost like doing a favor for the customers too, right? Like you don't want people to have to go rebuy their new cooler that they bought, you know, for fifty bucks or whatever. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's good to hear. If you want to see a really interesting, I think very stylish design, quite PC. Actually, the title itself says that Tim Gray wrote this one up. Quiet PC launches the stylish, fanless Intel Nook-based PC. Uh, Quiet PC. Uh, if you're from outside of the UK, you may not know them. They are a UK retailer for PC and components. Um, uh, basically, this is based on Intel Skylake Nook platform. They call it the Ultra Nook Pro 6, uh, which I really want to call the Ultra Nooky Pro 6 because I'm lewd. Um, Intel Skylake's, uh, Skylake based Core i5 processor and a fanless chassis from Alusha. That's the R50. Uh, and I'm, I'm half tempted to try to track down the Alusha chassis because I just really like that whole big old copper stripe down the middle of it. Yeah, um, that's just a that's just a really nice looking enclosure. Yeah. It's yeah. made from single block of aluminum using a CNC machine and a five axis drill. Um, those bare copper, those copper plates are actually bare copper plates that uh, connect to uh, that 15 watt TDP Core i5 6260 CPU. Um, you can do a Core i3 at 2.3 gigahertz, a Core i5 at 1.8 gigahertz base, uh, up to 2.9 gigahertz turbo boost. Um, basically, you need a 15 watt TDB part. Um, I like it. 32 gigabytes of dual channel DDR4, a single M.2 form factor SSD, uh, and there's a Wi-Fi module pre-installed on that one. Two-year warranty. Uh, it is not inexpensive. This much style and substance is going to cost you uh, 575 pounds or roughly $840 without the operating system. Uh, go that is definitely up there. Processor, and you're up at $1,100. So, yeah. I mean, nooks yeah. are expensive, but that takes it another few notches higher. It looks nice, but um, it looks nice. I guess you're kind of justifying it by you're buying a kind of a piece of art at the same time, yeah. I guess. I don't know. No, I, that's actually, I think that's pretty reasonable. I yeah. Think it's a I mean, I, I really, really like the look of it. I just don't know that it's worth that much. If you want, um, you can go to Alusha, uh, you know, 
I don't think it's it's unfortunate you can't buy the case alone. Yeah. Uh, but if you do like a Core i3 6100 with eight gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabyte SSD, and we'll do Ubuntu, that price is out to. Dun dun dun. I love when they don't give you the price until you get into the car. Well, that's still 600 pounds. So yeah, still up there. Yeah. I tried. <laughs> They're beautiful. Though. If you haven't been to Alutia, A L E U T I A dot com, they have some really gorgeous computer designs. Um, the T3 fanless PC is particularly, uh, particularly epic. If you've never seen one of those, oh, oh my goodness! So, if you uh, are on a case hunt, another pretty case. Look at the, the uh, uh, Inwin. 303 mid tower steel and glass enclosure the im pay box of computer designs uh i don't particularly like im pay towers maybe because i saw too many of them when i lived in new york they're nice they're generic but this is a pretty stylish case yeah um you know and that's coming from somebody who's completely over case windows but it's basically a big old wall of glass on the side of your case i like the hexagonal patterning patterning um there's a closed panel a tempered glass, excuse me, I should correct myself. You can do a closed panel, which has the Inwin logo on it, which you may or may not like, or you can do the tempered glass panel design. Um, I, yeah, like I like the, the idea, like, I like the tempered glass thing because you don't have to worry about like, just acrylic just scratches way too easily for a side panel, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, it does add a little bit more of a hazard, like if you have kids that might, you know, grow. Well, that's why it's tempered stuff. and not death glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Um... And if you notice, there's a, uh, so the in -win logo on the front there is just kind of like, yeah. it's not, it almost looks like it's an LCD or some kind of screen. It's not, it's just like the logo, uh, just backlit. Um, and that same, uh, I, I assume that same piece of uh, plastic diffuser extends right. down and around all the other ports down the front. So if you're a person that likes to game in like a really dark room uh, and you still want to be able to plug stuff in your, in the front of your PC and see where you're plugging the stuff into, uh, it just kind of lights around the ports, which I think is pretty a uh, nice touch. Yeah. And, you know, it's got the, you know, it's, I like the fact it's got an enclosed, uh, you know, power supply chamber, the power supplies on the top of the machine to keep the heat up there. Um, you can do like, you know, 320 millimeter uh, fans or radiators or a full size radiator on the top of the machine, on the bottom of the machine. Uh, that big old hexagonal panel uh, on the base of the machine, the big old open honeycomb, so you can suck cool air in from the bottom machine and expel hot air out of the top. That has a built-in uh, that has a built-in dust filter, which I really appreciate. Having recently been in a case that basically had half of a cat inside of it, <laughs> dust filtering. I think dust yep. filtering is a good idea. Don't have prices yet. We expect it to start shipping in the United States after uh, Computex. Um, another crazy news. Uh, remember the cell phone jammers people were wandering around with uh, a couple yes. of years ago? Yeah. So two years ago, uh, the FCC, uh, it's a pretty good article on Network World. Uh, FCC formalizes massive fines for selling and using cell phone jammers. Um, you know, a few years ago, FCC announced its intention to fine Chinese electronics maker $34.9 in a Florida man, 48 thousand for respectively selling and using illegal cell phone jammers uh, uh this is by uh, paul mcnamara um and now there are uh press releases out today two years later that make it official uh and apparently neither of the people that were being fined bothered to try to defend themselves uh no one expects uh the fcc to be able to collect the 35 million dollars uh from a chinese company uh, so the the guy was using it on his commute. Yeah. Like what? You just want to jam? You've, you've, like... never, you've never commuted by train, have you? <laughs> oh, he was on a... Tr okay, so he was on his train. He was just like making oh, everybody's no, cell phone actually, not work. He was on Interstate 4. Yeah, so he's just like driving to work and just like making people's phones maybe not he work. Wanted, maybe oh. he felt he would be safer. He was probably assuming phones, he would jam phones and people would put them down and concentrate on the road when actually people get really upset and try to make their phone yeah. run. When it's suddenly yeah, that's the thing. You're just, you're just distracting people further and like yeah. potentially, you know, having them run off the road. Like that'd be even worse. It's just, I wonder how they track the guy down, right? Because he's like mobile. Uh, people, it became, I think, a regular occurrence. Uh, huh. And actually there's another Network uh, World article uh, by Stephen Lawson 
quote, it was Metro PCS, the regional mobile operator now owned by T-Mobile USA that tipped off the FCC that something seemed to be wrong on a stretch of Interstate 4 between Sefner and downtown Tampa, about 12 miles away. <laughs> um, on April 29th, 2013, Metro PCS reported that its cell towers along the route had been experiencing interference during the morning and evening commutes. The FCC came in with a direction finding uh, gear, which is pretty epic, and found strong wideband emissions coming from a blue Highlander, at which point FCC <laughs> agents and the local sheriff pulled the Highlander over. So, uh, oh, that's awesome. wonder what the guy's the excuse was. Second time in 48 hours, I'm going to say, I hope that juice was worth that squeeze. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, he was no in Florida. One, no one, no, no one uh, as far as I know, no one has a quote uh, for Mr. Humphreys. No, I didn't see one. And the fine apparently could have been as high, uh, as high as $337 if they charged him for the entire two years he was running it. Because Humphreys did tell the FCC apparently that he'd be running it for like 16, 16 months or two years. Uh, and it pretty much jammed all the cell phone signals, which really tends to irritate the FCC to no end. Yeah. Yeah. So a uh, bunch of new drivers recently. You know, since there's yeah. like games, since there's like games coming out left and right, you know, like it's like, like Overwatch Doom. week, <laughs> uh, Doom, Overwatch, um, the the new Nvidia driver. Uh, heads up, if you're on Vista, it's not gonna work anymore. Uh, you know, sorry, I think it's time to depreciate driver support for, <laughs> for Vista. I think I think they're okay. I don't think any pitchforks are gonna come out for that one. Um, well, but yeah, new Nvidia you, driver. Um. What were you going to say? <laughs> no, I was just saying maybe people just don't want to pay the money. Vista's still working, gosh darn it. I mean, it'll still work just with the older NVIDIA driver. I mean, you just you just be stuck on that driver. Sorry. Um, so uh, they, added, they added Overwatch for that one. AMD updated their driver recently. They did, uh, what was it? Uh, Vulcan support for Dota 2 was added in AMD's driver recently. There's a separate post on the site about that one, um, which I just found interesting and i guess the point that came up on the podcast last night was uh like people want to play it on even lower end hardware right uh because dota 2 is like all over the place supposedly i don't know i don't play it myself because i got don't got enough free time <laughs> so. well someday you'll have more free time you can play more someday games. Someday. someday oh my goodness hey we're gonna talk uh i love to talk to everybody about uh networking if you got any networking questions do me a favor tweet at patrick norton or at ryan shroud sort of some of the new networking stuff there's a ton of new networking hardware that's coming out in the next couple of months some of which is really compelling bringing uh you know corporate office style roaming uh to multiple repeaters throughout the house which i'm looking forward to um some of which is not nearly as exciting uh, but promises to be incredibly expensive but We'll get into that next week. There's just a ton of stuff uh, that we heard about at CES. It's also finally starting to ship. Um, I, have a, I have an interesting wireless networking tip for people. Ooh, fire uh, if you If you happen to be having weird, obscure wireless issues where only a couple of maybe not super popular devices decide to not connect to your wireless for a completely unknown reason, um, it might be because you're using a custom wireless Mac on your router. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, apparently there's some chipsets, some of the more obscure ones, uh, just do not like, um, you know, they, they pay attention to the first half of a Mac, which is a manufacturer, and they do different things based on the manufacturer. And if you just totally customize your, your wireless Mac, which I was doing more from a security standpoint, just that it wasn't like, you know, making my, my network a little more obscure to people sniffing. Uh, that's just because I, you know, have like a hacking background and stuff. But... Uh, apparently, by doing that, I broke the ability of some of my stuff on my network to connect to the thing. And uh, right. it was just such a weird thing, you know, that it just, it, it would even see them. The, the router would see the things trying to connect. They just wouldn't complete the negotiation and just disappear back off the network and fail. Um, just figured I'd throw it out there in case somebody's been scratching their head for a year or two trying to connect things to their <laughs> wireless and just giving up. Um, what? Doesn't it work? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much what I was doing for like months. I was like, what could this possibly be? And it was, oh, yeah, wireless Mac. Hmm. Hmm. And you would think it's not supposed to break something. You should be able to use a custom Mac, but well, it's just the way some, some people make their uh, wireless chips. It just broke it. You know, it's, I don't know. 
at this point, I'm always excited. It, as I shouldn't say this, but I'm still kind of excited when Wi-Fi runs and runs fast. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once once I rational. once once I change that back, like that's that was the only problem I was having with Wi-Fi. I've had. I'm surprised that I can have as many wireless devices like on my network and still go reasonable speeds. Um, you know, and just have everything work. I'm just surprised it works that well, given like I'm in a neighborhood, there's people nearby, other wireless networks, everybody has like a pretty high-end wireless router that's using like wide spectrum um, or wider channels. So, hmm. There you have it. Oh my goodness. What do we got? Any keys that you're working on uh, over at PC Per? Uh, I'm working on a few things, uh, none of which, they're, they're all under NDA still. Um, Ryan's traveling. Uh, actually, one thing we can talk about, but I don't think it's over here for me to point to it. Um, we're looking at a Corsair Lapdog. Hear that Ooh. thing? Yeah, I got to play around with one uh, when we got the keyboards a few weeks ago. That's yeah, awesome. it's a, it's it's pretty cool. It's got like um, it's not memory Crazy foam, but it's like keyboard. a. It's like a magnetic foam thing sticks to the bottom and it's meant to like be comfortable sitting on your lap. And then it's, you know, it's like, it's like a, it's, it matches all of the Corsair aluminum extruded keyboards. Like it matches them perfectly, right? Like it's made of the same aluminum kind of extrusion stuff. So uh, you put a Corsair, um, either the mid size or the small size keyboards. If it has the macro keys on the left, it won't fit in this thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's got, you know, a spot for the keyboard to fit in the thing and screw in and become part of it, basically. And then there's a mouse pad, you know, like a built-in mousing surface uh, and a built-in hub. So you basically right. just plug everything into this thing. And then there, and then it comes with a really, I think it's like a 20-foot uh, powered USB extension cable um, to, you know, to go run out to whatever your PC is that you're trying to game on in your living room. So um, probably going to bring that thing to the house tonight and try to practically use it and see if I can game on my TV reasonably in my living room. We'll see. That's a good plan. But yeah, so I got a write-up on that coming up and uh, just everybody's working on stuff. Very cool. Yep. Oh my goodness. We just did, uh, Shannon is possibly, I think tomorrow morning is flying back from Japan. We had another pre-recorded episode this week. Um, if you're looking for an, a fantastic Bargain in in-ear monitors or earbuds. Uh, check out the brand One More, which has come out came out at CES this year. These turned out to be fantastic. With those the Focal Spears. Uh, and talked about uh, two-factor authentication tools, uh, Google Authenticator uh, uh, Duo, and all the rest of them. Shannon did a pretty good roundup on those. If you're kind of wondering, are some better than others? What tools can I use to do multi-factor or two-factor authentication? Uh, that was follow-up to our crazed password special last week. Uh, we had some questions about that. So do us a favor, go check that out at techthing.com. You can find more Alan's work at pcper.com. And if this is your first time hearing this podcast, this is uh, Twitch. And uh, that is twitch.tv slash twitch to find all our older episodes and to learn how to subscribe. And uh, we want to thank each and every one of you for listening in. Uh, Ryan will be traveling in China next week. We hope to get some reports from him, but... Uh, uh, we will keep you posted on what is happening at Computex, which is where Ryan is right now. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And Alan, thank you so much for making time and uh, geeking out with us today. Yeah, no problem. Right, I'm Patrick Gordon. I'm Alan Mamantano. See you next week on Twitch.